special joy to worship with you guys this week and to have an opportunity to open the Word of God for you. I um, have you on my heart all the time, day after day after day, thanking the Lord for you and for what He's doing here and for our faculty and our staff and the impact that our school is having. And it, it's always a joy to me when the world has to recognize the uniqueness of this university. And we see that, uh, such as in the Wall Street Journal article from a week or so ago. Um, I know it's not their favorite thing to uh, recognize some people who are dead serious about the Bible, but sometimes they don't have a choice. And that's always gratifying to me. So thank you for making the school what it is and for being so faithful to uphold your fellow classmates and faculty and staff in your prayers and that the Lord may continue to bless us as we remain faithful to Him. So on Monday, I um, identified the key to the Christian life, 1 Corinthians 10.31, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. That sums up everything. And uh, we talked about two ways in which we glorify God. There are many more. We'll work on some of them this morning. But in order to glorify God, you must begin by confessing Jesus as Lord. That's what Philippians 2 says, confess Jesus as Lord to the glory of God. You can't glorify God and not love His Son. You can't honor God and not embrace His Son. God is only honored when his son is honored. If his son is not honored, then he is not honored. So all of our ability to glorify God starts with giving glory to the Son of God, which is to embrace him as Lord and Savior. And secondly, in a, in a broad sense, the, the second principle to living in the direction of the glory of God is to aim your life at that purpose. That is your aim. That is your focus. And we talk about that at any cost, no price too high. We talk about the fact that if your life is aimed at the glory of God, you suffer when God is dishonored. You feel the pain when He is dishonored. And we talked about the fact that when your life is aimed to the glory of God, you are content to be outdone by someone else who does what you do and gets maybe more obvious affirmation or benefit. It can never be about you. If you're aiming your life at His glory, it can never be about you. Now, I want to take us to a third way in which we glorify God, and this is obviously a very basic one, but very important. We glorify God by confessing sin. By confessing sin. I want to show you some things in the Old Testament. Back in Joshua chapter 7, there is a story about Uh, Achan, you all know that, that's a familiar name, Achan, who was just Achan to steal things. That's the way I remember him. Anyway, the children of Israel were told when they go into the land of promise not to take anything. Um, That was not how Achan responded. He, um, He disobeyed that. And so they, they lost the battle. And he was confronted, and I won't go through the whole story, but just to take it down to verse 19, when Joshua, the leader, confronts Achan over his sin, a sin that had massive effect on the the whole of the children of Israel, Joshua said to Achan, my son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. So Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, then I coveted them and took them And behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. That's a full disclosure. But I want you to notice the point. Joshua says to him in verse 19, Give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, 
and tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. You have all the way back in the book of Joshua the recognition that when you confess your sin, you are giving glory to God. You are giving glory to God. It's very important to do that from a repentance standpoint. It's also important to do that from the standpoint of God's reputation. Because if things go wrong in your life as a result of your sin, and they very often do because the Lord disciplines you, when you have taken full responsibility for your sin, it exonerates God from being unkind or unfair. You Literally, in confessing your sins, you, you say, Lord, I have sinned. I need your forgiveness, but I also understand that I deserve your chastening so that whatever happens to me, I take full responsibility for that, and you as a righteous and holy God have every right to bring discipline into my life. You confess your sin, and I don't know that we think about this very often, as a, an open reality so that whatever difficulties God brings into your life as a result of that sin, you take full responsibility for and God is not impugned. You're protecting His reputation as the righteous one, the holy one. You're saying, in effect, if things go wrong in my life, it's because I've deserved them. There's another illustration of this in 1 Samuel. It's very dramatic, chapter 5. The, uh, you, the whole section from 4 through 6 of 1 Samuel is an account of the, the Philistines stealing the Ark of the Covenant. Um, the Ark of the Covenant represented the, the presence of God to Israel. And the Philistines thought, of course, as pagans, that there was, there was something magic about that box. And... Um, when Israel was engaged with the Philistines, you can start it in chapter 4, they were fighting each other, and things weren't going too well. And in chapter 4, verse 5, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp. Somebody said, we're not doing well in this battle, go get the Ark. Somebody go get God. Get the box. It represents God's presence. So when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth resounded. God's here. God just arrived with the box. And of course, the Philistines were panicked. In verse 7, woe to us. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who's going to deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? Strangely, verse 10 says, the Philistines fought. And Israel was defeated so much for bringing God, so much for the magic of the little box. In fact, it was so devastating, 30,000 foot soldiers from Israel were slaughtered. 30,000. And then to make it worse, verse 11, the ark of God was taken. They stole God. From a pagan viewpoint, they just thought the box was an idol. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, two corrupt sons of the high priest, died. This is a troublesome moment for Israel because they figured God would show up and they would win. God showed up, they lost, and they took God. Old Eli died in verse 18. He fell over and broke his neck and died because he was old and heavy. Moral of that story is when you get old, don't be heavy. (laughs) And all kinds of other bad things. They stole God. That was a problem for Israel, but that was a bigger problem for the Philistines. Now they've got God on their hands famous statement in verse 21 of chapter 4, the glory has departed. The glory of God was, in effect, gone. 
Repeat it again in verse 22. So as you come to chapter 5, the Philistines have a very serious dilemma. They have God on their hands, and it does not go well. So what are they going to do with the box? Well, as idolatrous people, they figured this is another idol. So in verse 2 of chapter 5, they took the ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon. Dagon was a a reverse man-made, I mean like mermaid, um, with the head of a fish and the body of a man rather than the body of a fish and the head of a man. So they set the, the ark of God in the temple of Dagon. And they came back in the morning, guess what? And verse 3 says, Dagon had fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. What happened? Dagon, when they come back in the morning, is tilted over and bowing down to this little box. And so they took Dagon, verse 3 says, and set him in his place again. What, what, what happened? Some kind of localized earthquake or what? So when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord again. Only the problem this time was his head was whacked off. Both the palms of his hands were whacked off at the threshold, and only the stump or trunk of Dagon was left. Dagon was bowed down and totally dismembered. Terrifying. Verse 5 tells you that this was the end of Dagon worship, which makes good sense. Therefore, the priests of Dagon, nor all who enter Dagon's house and tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod, never ever entered again. And then the Lord struck them. He ravaged them with tumors, verse 6. And the men of Ashdod saw that it was so. They said, the ark of God, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us. His hand is severe on us and on Dagon, our God. Get rid of that box. What are we going to do with it, they ask in verse 8. They sent it, verse 10, to Ekron. And as the ark of God came to Ekron, the Ekronites cried out, they've brought the ark of God of Israel around to us to kill us and our people. They, they sent, therefore, and gathered all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place so that it will not kill us and our people. Verse 12, and interesting, the men who didn't die were smitten with tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. They, they recognized that they had offended this deity. Chapter 6 then begins by saying the ark of the Lord has, had been in the country of the Philistines for seven months, bouncing around from place to place. So finally, there's a council and the priests and diviners in verse 2, and they said, what do we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we shall send it to its place. And then this most interesting approach. They said, if you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty. But you shall surely return to him a guilt offering. These are pagans. And they have, a, have enough sense to know that they have so severely offended the God of Israel that they have to acknowledge their guilt. So don't just send it back. Send with it a guilt offering. Then you'll be healed and it'll be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. So in verse 4, they said, what's going to be the guilt offering that we shall return to him? They said, five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for one plague was on all of you and on your lords. What in the world is that? That's what's called a votive offering. The plague had been delivered by mice as plagues through ancient history have, mice and rats. And the tumors were part of the plague as well, some kind of genuine 
pandemic of tumors. And the response was to say, okay, God of Israel, we get it. We offended you, and that's why the rats brought the disease. That's why we have all these tumors in addition to death. We accept full responsibility for offending you, and we acknowledge that in the votive offering. I saw an illustration of this, saw several really, but in the Mediterranean area, visiting some of the ancient ruins of the cities of Paul. You go in the back of a temple, and you find in the back of that temple, made out of clay, every possible part of the human body, a finger, an elbow, an arm, a leg, a head, an internal organ, a heart, the kidneys, whatever it is. And uh, I was instructed, this is many, many years ago, that all of these were votive offerings by which the people acknowledged that what was wrong with them was their offense against their God, and to show their God that they understood the offense had brought about the illness, they took in a replica of the part of their body that was affected. They saw the way that they had to make things right with that God was to take full responsibility for what happened to them. This is a pagan notion, but it also is true when you're dealing with the true God. So in verse 5, make likenesses of your tumors. So they were supposed to dig into the clay and create a clay tumor and likenesses of your mice that ravage the land. And here's the key statement. And give glory to the God of Israel. You always give God glory when you take full responsibility for your sin so that whatever He does in response to your sin, He is not accused of any wrongdoing, but rather of behaving in a righteous way consistent with His holy nature. You understand that? So confessing your sin is not just some transactional thing by, by which you go from being in a bad relationship with the Lord, though you have one, to, to a better relationship with the Lord, you are making an open declaration that whatever goes wrong in your life, whatever God allows, you have to recognize is deserved. In fact, the truth of the matter is, a whole lot more is deserved. But we are under grace. So, even the pagans understood that they needed to confess their offense against God if they wanted Him to take His hand of punishment off of them. You remember the thieves on the cross. You remember one statement by one of the thieves? It was this statement. We indeed suffer, do you know the next word? Justly. But this man has done nothing. And of course, we know the story about that thief. We indeed suffer justly. That's the genuine confession that takes any accusation against God off the table. In the book of Revelation, chapter 16, this is looking into the future tribulation. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and was given to scorch men with fire. This is looking at the future. Men were scorched with fierce heat. This is one of the final bowls of wrath. There are seven seals, and out of the seventh seal come seven trumpet judgments. Out of the seventh trumpet judgment come seven bowls. So you're, this is all rapid fire at the very end of the tribulation, right before the return of Christ. The fourth angel then, verse 8, pours out his bowl, a bowl of wrath upon the sun, and was given it to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. They cursed God for what was happening, as if God was unjust. 
and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Very specific statement. Repentance gives glory to God. When David sinned, he took full blame. And he lays it out in Psalm 51. In the New Testament, 1 John says that if we deny our sin, we make God a liar. Confession is to admit sin, to repent of it, turn and go the other way, and abandon it. And then whatever God brings by way of chastening, you acknowledge is just. There's a fourth way in which we glorify God. And for this one, we'll look to the New Testament, the book of Romans. But it is by trusting Him. By trusting Him. And again, as you can tell so far, these are explicitly tied, these behaviors, to the glory of God in these passages. This one is very interesting and also very foundational. If you're a Christian, you say you believe in the Lord, right? If you say you believe in the Lord, you believe in His power, you, you believe in His purposes in the world, you believe His Word, you, you believe, you trust, you trust Him. This is the way you glorify God. In the fourth chapter of Romans, the theme here, of course, is justification by faith, and Abraham is the example. But go down to verse 19. We'll pick it up there. Speaking of Abraham, Paul says, without being weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. Okay, they've never had children. Sarah's 96. He's 100. God has come to him and said, if you look back at verse 17, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. How can you be the father of many nations if you can't be the father of, of one? How does that work? I'm 100. Sarah's 96. We're both so far over the hill. We're not about to produce one, let alone a nation. But Abraham believed God. Verse 20 says, Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. God is glorified when we believe his word. God is glorified when we believe his promises. God is glorified when we trust him. Believing God in hard times, that's basically the theme of the 11th chapter of Hebrews. You can look at the chapter yourself and go through all the heroes of faith who believed God. And um, in the most dire of circumstances, Abraham is there, but so are a lot of others who are named, and then a whole lot who aren't named, who suffered, who suffered profoundly, who suffered even death. but never wavered in their faith. That whatever was going on was in the purpose of God's will and for His glory and for the believer's good. If you say you believe in the Lord, you say, well, I, I believe the Lord. He's my Savior. I, I love Him. I trust Him. And then you're a basket case over the smallest difficulties in life, you're not doing so well in terms of testimony. Another one is, that I love on this illustration is back in Daniel chapter 3, this story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And down in verse 16 of Daniel 3, when they're confronted by Nebuchadnezzar, it's going to throw them in the furnace 
they said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. Well, the question was, why did you defy the king's decree when you were told not to pray? Why did you do that? We don't need to give you an answer concerning this matter. That's a way of saying, um, we're not here to defend ourselves. We're not here because we think, you have power over us. We're not going to try to evade your hostility and your power. No, on the other hand, verse 17, I love this. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire. If God wants to deliver us, He can deliver us. And He will deliver us eventually out of your hand, O King. But I love this, verse 18. Even if He does not, let it be known to you, O King, that we're going to serve, we're not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. Now, it's one thing to believe God when everything goes well, but to believe God when you're standing on the edge of the fiery furnace... Say, go ahead, throw me in. I believe God. I believe God will deliver us from, or He will deliver us out of, or He will deliver us after, but He will deliver us. Without all of the New Testament revelation that we have to enhance our understanding of the trustworthiness of God, without all of the Old Testament, without all of the Psalms and everything else that assure us of God's care, these four men stood on the edge of the fire, the edge of death and incineration, and never flinched because they trusted God would deliver them. That gives Him glory. When you say He saved you and He delivered you from eternal hell, and He forgave your sin, and He is the omnipotent God of your life, and He's in charge of your life, and He's making everything come together for good because you belong to Him. When you say that, it better show up in the way you face the difficulty. So we glorify God by confessing Jesus as Lord, by aiming our life at that purpose, by confessing sin and by trusting Him. A fifth way in which we glorify God is found in the 15th chapter of John. John chapter 15, our Lord in the upper room talking to His disciples the night He was betrayed. And this is a very basic reality as well. All of these that I'm pointing out to you are. John chapter 15, our Lord is speaking to the disciples in the upper room, and you're familiar with it. I am the true vine, my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, He takes away. That would be the Judas branch. That's what is on His mind in the context. And every branch that bears fruit, the other apostles, He prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You'll you'll have some discipline in your life to be most fruitful. You're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. That's, that's a Judas branch. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, whatever you wish, you ask, and it will be done for you. And then this verse 8, my Father is glorified in this. That's, again, another explicit statement about glorifying God. My Father is glorified in this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples not proving it to him. He knows those that are his, John 10. My sheep hear me. I know them, and they know me. But to prove to everybody else. How do you prove? 
that you're a disciple of Christ by bearing much fruit, and in that the Father is glorified. Fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. And the the metaphor here is obviously agricultural. You have a vine and the branches and the fruitfulness attached to that. This is a foundational truth for all of us to remember. Listen to Philippians 1.11. Well, we can back up to verse 9. Uh, This I pray that your love may still abound more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Then verse 11, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Again, fruit, the fruit of righteousness that comes through the presence and the power of Christ to the glory and praise of God. God is glorified by our fruitfulness. There are many illustrations of this throughout the Scripture. But what exactly is fruitfulness? Well, it's the fruit of righteousness. We, we read that. So it is righteousness as opposed to anything other than righteousness. In uh, Colossians 1.10, we can add this, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Every good work, every righteous work is fruit. And every advance in your understanding and knowledge of God is fruit. So, Fruit is his attitude. It's, it's how you think about reality and about God in particular. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now, those are all attitudes. But that's fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. So what is fruit? It's the right attitude. It's, it's this, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness or meekness, self-control. That's attitude fruit. And that is where all fruitfulness begins. It begins in your your attitude. In Hebrews 13, there is a beautiful statement in verse 15. Through him then, that is Christ who is our Redeemer, through him let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. So, fruit is an attitude, and fruit is praise, worship, thanksgiving. That's the attitude. The action then, all good works, all righteous deeds. So you have the attitude fruit and the action fruit, And those are the things that put our identification as belonging to Christ on display. Again, the idea is you prove to be a disciple when the attitudes and the thankfulness and the actions of righteousness are manifest. I mean, it's just another way to say, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father who's in heaven. God is glorified in good works. And we, we were introduced by Hebrews 13, 15 to the idea of praise. So let me show you, if I have maybe time for one or two more. Um, in um, Psalm 50, there is a direct statement with regard to praise. Psalm 50, 
down in verse 23. He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. Do you know that is how you glorify God? We do that. We even acknowledge that. We're, when we praise and worship God, we are saying thank you to God and we are giving him honor. But let me just kind of break it apart for you. Praise comes down to three things. One, reciting the truth of God's character. That's what we do when we sing. We, we talk about the character of God, the attributes of God. That's the first thing. And the Psalms give us almost an exhaustible access to ways in which those attributes of God can be articulated. So praise is reciting God's character. The reason you want to be a student of Scripture, the reason you want to fill yourself, your mind with Scripture, is so that you can constantly and continuously be expressing to God the truth of His glorious character. This is who you are his attributes. Secondly, praise is the recitation of his works. First it's his attributes, and then it's his works. That's why you want to be a student of Scripture as well. If you have a problem and you come to the Lord in prayer, you can begin by saying, God, I know you're the creator of the universe. I know nothing is outside your control. I know you are sovereign. I know you are loving. I know you are wise. I know you're omnipotent. I know you're omniscient. I know you're immutable. You're never going to change. And you can go down the list of that. You're full of mercy, full of grace. Forgiveness of sin is a delight to you. I know this about you. I know this about you. I know this about you. And then I know this about you, Lord. You, you, you are the God who created everything in six days. You, you are the God who parted the Red Sea. You are the God who delivered your people through the plagues. You are the God who, and you just go through the history of the Scripture. And when you're done with all that, you can say, hey, Lord, could you help me on the quiz? <laughs> yeah, I think you probably could. You probably have that ability. So it's being able to literally recite all the attributes of God so that they just circle in your mind. That's one of the reasons music is so important. Because we, we hear God's attributes being articulated in a tune and in a poetic form that is memorable. And then we recite his wonderful works all the way from the creation to the future and particularly through the work of Christ. And the third thing is say thanks. This is who you are. This is what you've done. This is what you are doing. This is what you will do, and say thanks. That is essentially what goes on in the Psalms. Those three things are basically a summation of the point of the Psalms. They talk about God's character. They talk about his works, and they say thanks. Listen to Psalm 57 with those things in mind. Be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you. In the shadow of your wings I'll take refuge until destruction passes by. I will cry to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He reproaches him who tramples upon me. He will send forth his loving kindness and his truth. My soul is among lions. I must lie among those who breathe forth fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongues a sharp sword. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They dug a pit before me. They themselves have fallen into the midst of it. 
My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing, yes, I will sing praise. Awake, my glory. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the people. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your loving kindness is great to the heavens and your truth to the clouds. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. Nothing in that psalm says that the trouble passed by. But the psalmist is lost in praise. Another way in which we glorify God, this one in John's Gospel, chapter 14. And it's a very simple, straightforward one. Again, we're back to the upper room with Jesus and the disciples. And he is offering comfort to them, even though he is leaving. And here is the sunum bonum. This is the high point. I mean, this is just beyond what you could hope for. But so merciful and generous is our God. Verse 13. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. Wow. Wow. Whatever you ask in my name, what does that mean? And if you, if you ask for a million dollars and say, in Jesus' name, amen, you're going to get it? No. In my name doesn't mean with my name thrown on at the end. It means consistent with my nature and consistent with my purpose. Whatever you ask in my name, consistent with my purpose, that will I do. And why do I answer your prayers? so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Again, God answers prayer to put His glory on display. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If it's your will, if it's your design, if it's for your glory and your honor, do it, Lord, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you, um, if you don't pray a lot, you don't have the privilege of seeing the, the glory of God in the answer. If you don't pray, you're not going to change the course of history. If I don't pray, I'm not going to change the course of history, but we'll cha definitely change the course of our lives. Because I can tell you one of the great joys of life is to be an intercessor for some great need that the Lord answers and to understand His glory because you are part of that praying process. It isn't that you pray to make God do something He wouldn't otherwise do, although God expects you to pray with importunity, persistence, it is that you might be so engaged with God that you get the full benefit of His supernatural response. Wondrous things will happen without you, but you won't enjoy the blessedness of that. You won't enjoy the fulfillment of realizing that you were one of those who were part of that great force who prayed and and God answered. Pray so that you can see God's glory on display. Um, let me just mention a few. You can, you can look at them on your own. Using your gifts is another way we glorify the Lord, and I'll just mention these. 1 Peter 4.10 as each one has received a special gift, your spiritual gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks, if your gift is a speaking gift, do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves, if yours is a nonverbal serving gift, do so as one who is serving by the strength with God, which God supplies. Why do you use your gifts? 
so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You have been given a spiritual gift, a capacity, an enablement by the Holy Spirit. When it is used, it is used to effectively build up the body of Christ to the glory of Jesus Christ. And to Him, of course, belongs all the glory. I'll give you one, one more. 2 Corinthians 4. I'll save the others for a later time, maybe. 2 Corinthians 4. Down in verse 15, we'll just, we'll hit verse 15. Paul is explaining his ministry here. He, uh, he talks about ministry in the first verse, chapter 4. We have this ministry. In verse 2, he says, We have renounced the things hidden because of shame. There's no secret sin life. We don't walk in craftiness. We don't twist and pervert the Scripture. We don't adulterate the Word of God. Uh, we preach the Gospel, verse 5. We, we do not preach ourselves. We preach Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your slaves. He's talking about ministry. He's talking about the trials of ministry. In verse 8, if afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. In other words, he lived on the brink of death, actual death at the hands of his enemies in order to bring life through Christ to the people. He who, he says, we who live, verse 11, are constantly being delivered over to death, and he means death, physical death by his haters, for Jesus' sake. And why do we do this? So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. This is so basic. We proclaim the gospel we preach the gospel, the glorious gospel mentioned back in verses 6 and 7. We do that. Why do you do that? Well, we know that death works in us. I mean, verse 12, we face death. But by facing death, we bring you life. And his hope, of course, is in verse 14 that even if he dies, he will be raised by Jesus who was himself raised. So why do you do this, Paul? Verse 15. All things are for your sakes. This is, a, this is a life that is a complete sacrifice. Nothing for me. Everything I do, every dangerous, precipitous occasion I take to face the enemy down is for your sake, so that the grace which is spreading, the grace of salvation, which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I do this to bring people the gospel so that they can be saved and I can add one more voice to the hallelujah chorus. That's, that's how he looked at his ministry adding voices who would give thanks to the glory of God. You glorify God when you lead others to Him. You glorify God when you lead others to Him. In fact, that's a, that's a substantial way to glorify God because now you have a whole being who can glorify God in all the other ways. The New Testament talks about the fact that we glorify God in our unity, we glorify God in our contentment, and other things. But the bottom line, I think, for us anyway, th th these two days, is to understand living your life to the glory of God means doing absolutely everything to bring honor to His name. That's the sum, that's the soul, that's the heart of living as a Christian. 
Father, we are so grateful that you have given us such depth of truth, such richness that we could not possibly mistake the responsibility that we have. May we be faithful now to what we know. May we realize that all joy, all usefulness, all blessing is found when we live to your glory. May we not believe the lies of the enemy, that, that satisfaction comes in dishonoring you. We know that's not anything but a lie from hell. Satisfaction and joy comes only from giving you glory. Give us all a taste of that daily, we pray, as we are faithful. Amen.